Hi, I am uh, Captain Luis Carlos Montalvan. And uh, before I begin to discuss uh, my portion of the breakdown of the military, uh, I just want to bring something to light because, uh, uh, as many of you have heard, uh, last night I heard uh, some of the protesters outside who said that we should uh, that we should move to be to testify under oath. You know that 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 the panelists, that those who testify, if they allegations, if their testimony is is indeed relevant, that they they should swear under oath by it. I, for one, am. I'll, I'll gladly uh, uh, as, uh, yeah, as I'll stack, I'll say. Uh, stack of Bibles. So. Yeah, and, 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 and that's exactly what the point that I'm making is that is that I can speak for myself. Those two gentlemen spoke for themselves. I, I would not, I would I would like nothing better than to testify under oath before Congress. <laughs> And also to those protesters outside who, uh, you know, not, not to denigrate, yeah, all two of them, <laughs> um, not to denigrate them too, too much, uh, but, you know, uh, to say that they're intellectually challenged is, is an understatement. But, but, but what I want to, what I want to quote is, is, is a phrase, is a, is, a, is a statement, before I get to the breakdown of the military, is something that's very appropriate. And uh, it's from a distinguished American, um, most of you who, who all know. And that quotation is the following. To say that there should be no, that there should not be any criticism of the president is not only unpatriotic and servile, but is morally treasonous to the American people. And that, that, that statement was by Theodore Roosevelt. So to those people, those citizens, those chest thumping, you know, uh, people, American citizens who would carry the flag off of a cliff due to their naivete and ignorance, uh, I would remind them uh, of this quote, and I would remind them that uh, uh, a, if they have not been to Iraq, uh, you know, they don't they don't have an understanding of of what's going on. And to those who have been to Iraq, they haven't studied deeply what what has transpired. Now, getting, getting to my testimony here, and I have uh, uh, a number of points to make. I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to read some excerpts from Brigadier General Sir Nigel Alwyn Foster, uh, who wrote a paper in November called Changing the Army for Counterinsurgency Operations. I'm going to read some excerpts from the GAO report from the summer of 07, articulating the, the, uh, the hundreds of thousands of missins, missing weapons and equipment. Um, uh, I'm going to articulate uh, some uh, from, the, from the National Guard Bureau from September 07, General Blum's report uh, concerning the status of the National Guard. I'm going to talk about Barry McCaffrey's after action report from December 18, 2008. Um, I'm going to talk about an article written by a good friend of mine who I had the privilege of serving with in Iraq in the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Paul Yingling, entitled, A Failure of Generalship. Um, and then I'm going to talk on a more personal level about uh, some issues that I dealt with in Iraq, um, both at the tactical, operational, and strategic levels. Um, and then, again, at AEI, uh, uh, of which I was a member of, the, of those that contrived the surge. And I'll qualify that by saying to you all that I was vehemently against the surge, but being a subject matter expert of Iraqi security forces, um, I was invited to discuss Iraqi security forces and to discuss 
the nature of corruption that I wrote about extensively in the New York Times in January of 07. And, and I'll add one more thing to that, a shameless plug to my website, which is basically my name, LuisCarlosMontalban.com, and I've written over a dozen op-eds um, uh, very much in keeping with IVAW's um, objectives. And I'm a, a new member of IVAW, so, and I'm proud of that. Uh, so I'll talk about some personal experiences, uh, one about the borders of Iraq, namely the Pisces system, about a hero by the name of Colonel Ted Westhussing, um, and uh, uh, I'll talk about uh, uh, some, some additional contractor corruption and briefly some humanitarian issues. So moving right along into that. Um, in 2005, November of 2005, Brigadier General Sir Nigel Allen Foster of the British Army, he wrote a, a, a paper uh, titled Changing the, the, the Army for Counterinsurgency Operations. And it made the rounds in the, in, in the military intellectual community. It was published in, in Britain in their, in their military journal and in our military journal um, called Military Review. And it caused a great deal of controversy because, among other things, I'm going to read some, some excerpts from this because it's very appropriate to the, the topic of the breakdown of the military, specifically the U.S. Army. So uh, indulge me for a moment while I, while I read from his, uh, a few key points from his, uh, his note. The QDR, meaning the Quadrennial Defense Review, notes that in analysis of 127 U.S. pacification operations in Iraq between May 2003 and May 2005, most operations were reactive to insurgent activity, seeking to hunt down insurgents, while only 6% of operations were directed specifically to create a secure environment for the population. That's important because we were engaging in search and destroy tactics, which were the tactics used by, thank you, the tactics used by, unsuccessfully used by Westmoreland and the generals in Vietnam prior to General Creighton Abrams uh, a change of strategy to clear and hold, which later became in this war known as clear, hold and build. The there was a strong focus, I'm quoting here from General Foster, there was a strong focus on raiding, cordon and search, and sweep operations throughout. The one-day brigade raid is the preferred tactic. There was a preference for large-scale kinetic maneuver and focus on killing insurgents, not protecting the population. This sense of moral righteousness combined with an, an emotivity that was rarely far from the surface is in extremists manifested as deep indignation or outrage that could serve to distort collective military judgment. The most striking example during this period occurred in April 2004 when insurgents captured, in, uh, captured and mutilated four U.S. contractors outside of Fallujah, which was mentioned here and, and was in my area of operations in 2003-2004, uh, in whereby um, the Marine Corps uh, evoked a disproportionate response to that heinous crime, thereby polarizing the situation and driving a wedge between the domestic population and coalition forces. And that wedge succeeded. The precise chain of events leading to the committal of U.S. And Iraqi security forces are reasons for the, sub -sub of the subsequent failure to clear what, be what had become a terrorist stronghold lie well beyond the classification of this paper. However, the essential point is that regardless of who gave the order to clear Fallujah of insurgents, even those, command those U.S. commanders and staff who generally took the broader view of the campaign were so deeply affronted on the occasion that they became set on the total destruction of the enemy. Under, under emotional duress, even the most broad-minded and pragmatic reverted to, to kinetic-type operations. 
which in essence means that, and not to denigrate the United States Marine Corps because the United States Army's had its share of, of, uh, of follies and, uh, and uh, disproportionate and, and ill use of force. But this is a good example. This is an early example in 2004 where the insurgency began to take hold between, between Abu Ghraib in April of 2004 and the and Fallujah being basically destroyed in April of four, that was a decisive point in 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 potentially winning the hearts and minds of the Iraqi people. Uh, another point that Sir uh, Nigel Allen Foster brings up is that uh, commanders and, and staff at all levels were strikingly conscious of their duty, but rarely, if ever, questioned authority. Staunch loyalty upward and conformity to one's superior were noticeable traits. Each commander has, has his, uh, had his own style, but if there, was, if there was a common trend, it was micromanagement with many hours devoted to daily briefings and updates. Skipping on, the U.S. Army's laudable and emphatic can-do approach to operations paradoxically encouraged another trait which has been described elsewhere as damaging optimism. Self-belief and resilient optimism are recognized necessities for successful command. However, it is unhelpful and if it discourages junior commanders, including myself, from reporting unwelcome news up the chain of command. The U.S. Army during this period in OIF exemplified both sides of this, of this coin. Most commanders were unfailingly positive, including in briefings and feedback to superior commanders, but there were occasions when their optimism may have served to mislead those trying to gauge progress. Like any deployed forces, Levels of proficiency were mixed, including discernible difference between formed units and ad hoc organizations. However, the range of competence among deployed U.S. Army personnel seemed more pronounced than in any other contributing nations, perhaps reflecting how gravely the inescapable requirement for manpower was overstretched leading to excessive deployments for individuals and causing the Army to dig deep into the reserves and those parts of the force with least expertise. Also, lastly, with, with respect to Brigadier General Sir Nigel Aller, Alwyn Foster's amazing document, he notes, again, he bulletizes the, the, the commander over optimism, which could sometimes compound the disinclination to adapt plans. And since it raised undue confidence in higher headquarters that existing plans were on track. A shortage of manpower from which to draw troops into theater leading to ver very varied levels of expertise which tended to compound the issues noted above. He also discusses at length the deprofessionalization of the U.S. Army. Um, he, he points out the deep, that, that the deprofessionalization occurred in the 1990s. He asserts that the culmination of the Army's post-Vietnam reprofessionalization came in the 91 Gulf War, when the Army was probably the most integrated and professional uh, ever. However, over the next six to eight years, it became more bureaucratized, centralized, and correspondingly less professional. It was just starting to recover from this when 9-11 happened, and it became unavoidably committed to such extensive and challenging operations. A significant symptom, and in a time of, of catalyst for the deprofessionalization of the Army, was the so-called exodus of the captains. Now a well-developed, documented phenomenon. Captains are a particularly significant rank in, rank in the U.S. Army as they provide the, the, the company commanders, and it is arguably the company and squad commanders who are the linchpin in the decentral, decentralized operations that tend to characterize counterinsurgency and other types of operations. 
According to Mark Lewis in the mid-90s, junior officers, particularly captains, began leaving the Army in, increasingly num in increasing numbers. The captain attrition rate exceeded the inflow ne necessary to maintain a steady state, such that by 2000, just before 9-11, the Army could only fill 50%, 56% of those positions intended for experienced captains with, with officers of the right quality and experience. Junior officers consistently express dissatisfaction with their jobs, with their leaders, with this sense of zero defects that was in our culture in the Army. This sense of junior, offer dissati junior officer dissatisfaction with the leadership became so profound that in one study commissioned by then Army Chief of Staff General Eric Chinsecki in, in the year 2000, it was reported that many officers believe that there needs to be a clear sweep of senior leadership. Now, there's no way I have two minutes left. I'm sorry, we, we kind of. I know. So I, I've got ten minutes left, and, and I and I employ you all for your for your patience because. Uh, Just like a captain. Uh, because this is important. Uh, I'll move on to the GAO report in the summer of 2007. Uh, the GAO reported that the United States spent $19.2 billion trying to develop Iraqi security forces since 2003, and, the G and that the GAO said, including at least $2.8 billion to buy and deliver equipment. But the GAO said that weapons distribution was haphazard and rushed and failed to follow established procedures, particularly from 2004 to 2005, when security training was led by General David H. Petraeus, who now commands all U.S. forces in Iraq. Now, I served at, at, the, at, the, at the operation on tactical levels. I served directly with the colonels, the generals that worked for General Petraeus. And I was, as a participant in the, in the American Enterprise Institute, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with the planning and the lack thereof of the surge and uh, many other instances of, of failure. The Pentagon did not dispute those GAO findings. They initiated investigations, and General Petraeus has kind of, you know, uh, uh, chalked it up to the fact that uh, no accountability was, was, was rendered because they needed to field this equipment to Iraqi security forces very quickly. However, it's noted that during the Bosnian conflict, the United States provided $100 million in defense equipment to the Bos Bosnian Federation Army, and the GAO found no problems in accounting for those weapons. In an article in September 2007 by uh, Lieutenant General H. Stephen Blum, who's the head of the National Guard, he said that the Army Guard is currently about only 50% of its required domestic uh, equipment uh, strength levels. He quote, my problem is not with the, uh, with the predictable events such as hurricanes. My problem is how we get the National Guard ready for no notice events that will happen, like an earthquake or tornado or a terrorist event or a combination of all three at the same time. He then says uh, quizzically that we have the most experienced, youngest, highest quality force that this nation has ever had in its army, an Army National Guard, uh, and that it's the best trained force since we've ever had in 371 years of, 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 uh, of service to nation. Now, I'll then take you to retired General Barry McCaffrey's December 18th report of 2007, most recently. And he conducted an AAR, as he has frequently done, for West Point and the DOD. And in his report, in contradiction to Stephen Blum's statement, uh, he describes, uh, 
he describes the following as a, 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 about the U.S. Army. He says, quite literally, the U.S. Army is too small and poorly resourced to continue successful counterinsurgency operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, at the current level. Our, our recruiting campaign is bringing into the Army thousands of new soldiers, perhaps 10 percent of the annual output input, who should not be in uniform. Criminal records, drug use, moral waivers, non-high school graduates, pregnant from basic training and therefore non-deployable, loyable, lowest mental category, etc. We're losing our combat experience, mere career NCOs and captains at an excessive rate, ROTC distinguished Marist graduates, of whom I'm one, West Pointers, officers, and engineering and business degrees, etc. Their morale is high and they're proud of their service, but they're under-resourced uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, he also notes that the National Guard and reserves are too small and inadequately resourced. Their equipment is broken and deployed. All of that contradicts General Blum's, you know, testimony in that he thinks that the Army is fine, other than the fact that, it's fifth, that the National Guard is 50 percent under strength. Now, moving right along, and, and I won't take too much more time. Um, please. But uh, please, to, please to not taking more time, or please to, to give me more we, time. Uh, I, I get to exercise in a privilege many an NCO has always dreamed of, and uh, ask an officer to wrap it up quickly. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, the, the breakdown of the military is 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 a, you know, is a complex issue, and and one and one as an officer that I'm familiar with, uh, I, I might add. So you know, I would in, I would I would uh, I, I would remark that. Um, uh, let me let me let me. Uh, I have much to say, and we can talk. Uh, reporters after this, but I have two specific personal events that I'd like to discuss briefly. One regarding a systems known as the Pisces. In 2003 and 4, when I was in Iraq at the tactical level as a, platoon, as a scout and tank platoon leader, um, I was staged at the Iraqi-Syrian border crossing at Al-Walid. At that time, we requested, among other things, some type of computer tracking system to track immigration and emigration, because obviously um, thousands and hundreds of thousands of people uh, move transnationally between that border crossing point. And in order to secure the border, the border, well, to, in order to, to secure Iraq, you need to try and track who's coming in and who's coming out. You need to do trend analysis. So we requested a system and a, a, a team uh, sent from CJTF-7 came out to assess the infrastructure for installation of a piece of equipment known as the Pisces system, which was devised by Booz, Allen Hamil by Booz Hamilton uh, uh, for the CIA. Uh, that, they didn't tell us when that system would be employed across the ports of entry of Iraq, and again, Iraq is a landlocked country, and those ports of entry are strategically important. The, in March of, of 04, and this is open source, you can, you can look to the CPA's uh, uh, documents, L. Paul Bremer and General Kimmett said that the Pisces system would be implemented by June of 2004 across Iraq. Now, I redeployed back to CONUS, to back to the United States. And when I went back to Iraq in 2005 and 2006, uh, I was put in charge of Iraqi security forces for, for the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment under the command of H.R. McMaster, who is a brilliant cerebral man uh, who is currently a special assistant to, the, uh, to General Petraeus himself. Um, that said, I, I inquired as to whether or not the Pisces system had been in place throughout the ports of entry in Iraq. I met, uh, uh, I went to the, to the Ministry of Interior in the Red Zone. I met with 
uh, all the, 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 the chiefs of the, of the Ministry of Interior, the Iraqi chiefs, the, uh, the members of the coalition, the, the uh, members of Minstiki, which General Petraeus was in command of, and all of them said that, well, one particular gentleman, a guy by the name of Commander Guy Velarde of the U.S. Navy Reserve, said the Pisces systems were, were in connexes in Baghdad. This was 2005, mind you. And again, I, this was 2003 that we requested this, that mm -hmm. the Pisces systems were sitting in connexes in Baghdad and they'd not been fielded as of yet. Fast forwarding to 2007, Brigadier General Joseph Phil, who was in charge of the, of the Civilian Police Assistance Transition Team Iraq, which is a sub-entity of Minstiki, which fell under General Petraeus's purview, came to, for a briefing as to the status of the Syrian-Iraqi border in Western Nineveh province. And uh, we briefed him that, that the Pisces system, that we required the Pisces system, and that that members of his command in Baghdad just a few months earlier had said that the Pisces would be implemented. Uh, however, that Pisces system had not been implemented as, as of August 2005. At that briefing, he, he, very, he scoffed at the Pisces system, saying that it was not a good system and that they didn't have it in their possession. Uh, I stood up from the back of the tent, the briefing tent, and I, I told the general, I said, sir, well, uh, I hate to disagree with you, but members of your team, Commander Guy Velarde, said that you, in fact, have that system and that that system may not be perfect, but we need to install it ASAP to, 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 uh, to enhance security for Iraq. Well, uh, he, he dismissed that again and, and said that they in fact did not have the Pisces system in, Iraq, in, in Baghdad. Uh, l seven months later, as I was departing Iraq in 2000, uh, 2006, I received a letter from Colonel, Full Bird Colonel Reserve Marine uh, Carl Lammers, who wrote a note to me saying, Captain Monsalvan, you were right. We do have the Pisces system. They're sitting in connexes in Baghdad, and, and so on and so forth. Flash forwarding to 2007 at the AEI conference that I was a part of, up until March of last year, the Pisces system had not been installed in any of the border, any of the ports of entry across Iraq. So for the better part of four years, there was no oversight regarding transnational movement of, of foreign fighters, of people, of, 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 of people who were fleeing. Um, there, was no, there was no accountability for that. And that, that is an example, that is a clear example of the type of dereliction of duty. I mean, General Petraeus, under his pure purview, under, uh, you know, in Minstiki, in command of Minstiki from June of, of 04 to November of 05, did not implement the Pisces system. And I would add most importantly that Scotland Yard, when they investigated and found the culprits of the London City bombing, it was the Pisces system that was implemented in Pakistan that led to the apprehension of those perpetrators.